Uh, good morning, everybody. This is David Cobb. Uh, I appreciate y'all uh, tuning in for the uh, November uh, Science Communication Webinar as part of the Understanding Our, our Wildlife, uh, Wildlife Commission Science Informing Conservation Series. So with that, uh, our presentation today is by uh, TR, by Thomas Russ. He's our Foothills Region Aquatic Wildlife Diversity Coordinator. Um, and his presentation, his webinar is on the uh, Roanoke Log Perch restoration in the Dan River, North Carolina. And so with that, TR, I'm going to let you share your screen and turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you, David, for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about Roanoke Log Perch. This is um, one of those, those science um, applied conservation stories. Um, that's taken several decades to come to fruition. Um, I've been working with the Wildlife Commission about 15 years, and I've been working on this project for five years, so I'm kind of coming in on the, the latter end of it, but it really is uh, a feel-good story for the Roanoke Law Perch and for um, aquatic non-game conservation in general. So the Roanoke Law Perch was uh, first discovered in 1889 by David Starr Jordan and uh, Barton Warren Everman. Uh, David Starr Jordan was a renowned ichthyologist, and they they found the Roanoke Law Perch in the Roanoke River upstream uh, of Roanoke, Virginia. And at the time, uh, David Starr Jordan had seen a lot of law perch, but he thought this one was a superb darter, and um, he coined the scientific name Persona Rex. Um, that this is the king of the darters. There's there's several log perch species in the Tennessee River Basin and the Mississippi River uh, drainage, but on the on the Atlantic Slope, there's only two species, the Chesapeake log perch and the Roanoke log perch. It is, it's believed that the Roanoke log perch came over from uh, the Blotchai log perch, which is in the upper Tennessee River Basin, and it is most closely related to the Blotchai log perch. In the late 70s and uh, 80s, Bob Jenkins and Noel Burkhead, uh, two Two renowned ichthyologists on the East Coast conducted a lot of work with the Roanoke log perch. They did distribution studies and life history work, and they found that the daughter uh, was was really pretty rare, and it was only in a couple streams. and And during the 70s and 80s, um, they they petitioned the Fish and Wildlife Service, and it was listed as fairly endangered in 1989. It is really a unique large daughter. They get to six or seven inches, and they have a really unique foraging uh, mechanism where they have a really uh, tough snout, a pig-like snout, and they flip lots of rocks uh, to forage. They'll flip pebbles an inch or two in diameter to get to the aquatic insects uh, below them. Just to give you an idea of the Roanoke River Basin, um, I won't talk much today about the, the Nottoway population. It's over here to the east. But the Roanoke River Basin is pretty large. Um, it's over 10,000 square miles. Um, about a third of it is in North Carolina, about 3,500 square miles. Uh, the Roanoke River is a big East Coast river, though. It's over 400 miles long. There's only two fairly large cities in the basin, though, Danville and Roanoke. Uh, the largest city is Roanoke in the far northwestern part of the basin. There's only there's fewer than two million people in the in the river basin, though, compared to the Noose River Basin, which drains Raleigh. It's about half the size of the Roanoke River Basin, um, less than 200 miles long, and there's over 2.5 million people in the Noose River Basin. Uh, so the Roanoke River Basin is is kind of a, an anomaly on the East Coast. In 1992, the recovery plan was published by the Fish and Wildlife Service. At the time, there was four, maybe five populations. Uh, in the recovery plan, there's there's typically two objectives for the Fish and Wildlife Service. It's either to downlist a species or delist. Uh, in in the Roanoke Law Perch recovery plan, there's seven uh, recovery tasks to meet these objectives. And uh, through my work and through the rest of this talk, I mainly talk about these two. Number one, to search for additional populations and or habitat suitable for enhancement or reintroduction efforts, and two, determine the feasibility of reestablishing the law perch in historical habitats and, re and reintroduce where feasible. And in the map on the left, um, just briefly, here's the upper Roanoke River population. 
um, to the west. It's upstream of Smith Mountain Reservoir. Here is the upper Smith River population. Here's the Pig River population in the Piedmont. And on the east coast is the is the Nottaway or the Chowan River population. Uh, in 1992, there was really four populations. There was a couple other individuals captured in Town Creek and downstream of, of Roanoke, Virginia, and in Town Creek in Virginia. Um, but really those four known populations Two of these were good and two were, were pretty low. What really changed for the Roanoke Law Perch after or among the listing was Hurricane One. In 1985, the worst recorded flood came into Roanoke, Virginia, and the Roanoke River really devastated uh, the city. The Army Corps of Engineers had been planning for a while to do a flood reduction project and it had been on the drawing board since the early 70s, but really in 1985, that propelled um, the legislator to approve a $72 million project in the, nine, in, in the late 80s for the Army Corps of Engineers to, to widen the floodplain and to reduce the amount of flooding in, in Roanoke. And they actually moved businesses out of the river. Well, the fear was that this work would jeopardize the most um, strong Roanoke, River, Roanoke Law Perch population. So Virginia Tech contracted with the Army Corps of Engineers to start monitoring the law perch. And their research ran from the late 80s to 2016. Uh, that was about 30 years worth of research on Roanoke Law Perch, all started because of um, a, per a perceived uh, impact to the population. In 2000, um, Jamie Roberts came on board with Virginia Tech and his work up until about 2015 with the college really propelled more research and more publications for this fish and our knowledge of the fish really grew. Uh, to date, there's over three dozen uh, published papers on this on this on the Roanoke Law Perch and probably dozens of reports done on the Virginia populations. Well, everything changed in North Carolina in 2007. Uh, Duke Energy uh, routinely surveys the Dan River uh, near their Eden coal-fired power plant. Y'all know what happened in the Dan River in 2014, uh, the coal ash spill. Prior to that, they had done surveys. In 2007, they turned up a Roanoke law perch in the Dan River near near uh, the Smith River confluence. Following that discovery, right here's the Smith, the Smith Mountain confluence. Um, North Carolina State Museum and Wildlife Resources really started putting more energy into into finding more Roanoke law perch. In 2008, 22 surveys were done in the Dan River Basin in North Carolina, and they turned up more in the Mayo River. Uh, Chris Wood was working with aquatic wildlife diversity then. In 2009, they continued more work, and with the Division Water Quality, they found um, a population in Big Beaver Island Creek, Cascade Creek. Chris Wood moved on to the mountains, and the, the Dan River population kind of just sat there for a couple years. In 2014 and 15, Aquatic Wildlife Diversity um, redid their organization, and I moved into the coordinator for this region where we were able to put more resources into the Dan River. Uh, we conducted 52 surveys in 2014 and 15 and found that the population was, was actually pretty robust. So when the recovery plan came out, there was four known populations. They're they're yellow on your map. Uh, two of those were were really were pretty good. Upper Smith and Roanoke River, Pig River was poor, and then the Nottaway really we didn't know much about. We still don't to this day. But but in 2015, um, Virginia had discovered two new populations in Goose Creek and Otter Creek, and then we had continued our work in the Dan and found more populations in the streams in the Dan River in North Carolina. Jamie Roberts published a report, and this is where this figure came from, talking about the population viability analysis and a minimum viable population needed for each of these populations. With this work, he was missing some of the genetic um, structure that we had in North Carolina. Um, he and I knew we had seven populations, but we didn't really know if our population was unique or if, if we wanted to do conservation, um, propagation, or reintroductions. Where, where could we get our broodstock from, et cetera? You know, how di diverse was our population? So in 2016, we collected 67 Roanoke law perch, clipped all those and sent them to Georgia Southern where Jamie Roberts had, had taken on uh, the job down there in Georgia. 
he combined those with uh, clips he already had from Virginia. And in 2017, he published a paper um, about this, about the genetic variation. And this is a PCA, a, a principal coordinates analysis. And each point represents one individual and individuals closer together in space share more alleles in common. Point color and shape indicates the stream of origin. So if you look on the key on the right, you have the upper Roanoke and the upper Smith, the two old known populations in gray and black. And on and in the PCA, they cluster together on the left as, as being genetically similar. And then all the other colors, the red, the yellow, um, the blues, they all cluster together with this uh, Middle Smith, Lower Smith, Mayo, Dan, and other creeks, uh, tributaries to the Dan River Basin as its own um, genetically distinct, not genetically distinct, but ge genetically isolated population. The belief was after 2017 was that this that waste from the upper Smith River had drifted down into the lower Smith River and eventually up through time enough waves had migrated into North Carolina down the Smith River into the Dan and up the Mayo River. Um, so now we have this this what Jamie coined the Dan River meta population. This is a table and I know tables are are looked down upon on and PowerPoints, but this is critical to understanding the Roanoke Law Perch population. Uh, this is the, on the left, you have the basins, the Roanoke, Dan, and Ottaway, and across the top, you have the population, the streams, the ecoregion, the range of that population, number of streams, total population size, and genetic diversity. And I highlighted in blue the four known populations um, when the species were listed. Since then, there in the center is the goose, otter, and dam populations. And if we just look at the Dan River population and we look at the geographic range, this is in kilometers. I'll go over miles in a second. Um, the Dan River really has a large population, 131 kilometers. Um, but more importantly, it has five uh, different tributaries that contribute to this meta population. That's important because if we lose one of these streams, if we lose the Mayo, we still have the Dan and the Smith. Or if we lose the Smith, we still have the Mayo and the Dan. If there's a catastrophic uh, fish kill, uh, the Dan, the meta population should remain strong. Um, the total population size in the Dan is estimated at over 11,000 individuals. And that's not as high as as the Nottaway or the Roanoke, but still, you know, that's a lot of Roanoke log perch. And the last column over there is ge the genetic diversity. And the closer to one, the more diverse the population. Um, we've Jamie knew for a while that the Roanoke River population was the best. It's it has one of the higher population size and it is the most diverse compared to the Roanoke to the Dan River Basin. Our, our genetic diversity is not as high as the Roanoke um, or the Nottaway or the Upper Smith, but 0.68 is is pretty good, and we feel like moving forward that that will give us enough of a population to pull from when doing uh, propagation. So this is just a little figure I, I took from Buckminster Fuller from 1982, and his thought was that you know in 1900 every every century our knowledge would double, and then every 25 years our knowledge would double. Well, we've come a long way since the 80s with Roanoke Law Perch. The science and the money and the and the projects put into this fish have come a long ways, and I would argue on on the East Coast and perhaps. The U.S. we've we've got no, more knowledge about this aquatic non-game species than any other fish. So, with this science, what are we going to do? You know, the fish has populated other streams on its own. It's migrated downstream with uh, juveniles and and adult waves coming out of a population. So, how can we contribute to the conservation of this fish? So, in 2019. Uh, Wildlife Resource Commission and Fish and Wildlife Service contracted with Conservation Fisheries, Fisheries Incorporated in Knoxville, Tennessee, to propagate some fish um, to reintroduce in the Dan River, specifically the Upper Mayo and Upper Dan. Um, however, in North Carolina, um, we have some restrictions on reestablishing uh, federally listed species where they don't occur. So we had to pivot in 2020 and call this augmentation. Um, and CFI was able to propagate these fish this year and in September of this year we stocked 130 uh, young in the year Roanoke law perch in the circled area in the figure um, 
particularly Big Beaver Island Creek. It's not labeled here, but it's those two points coming in from the north. The Big Beaver Island Creek is a, a pr pretty clean third order stream that enters the Dan River uh, about two about a mile below Lindsay Bridge Dam there. We moving forward, we want to put fish upstream of Washington Dam and Lindsay Bridge Dam uh, in the in the basin, but at the time and currently we still do not have capability of doing that. Here's a shot of some of the, the Young of the Year Roanoke Law Perch. Of all the law perch I've ever held, I've never held a Young of the Year Law Perch. It, this is about a six month old fish and they're already three inches long. They grow pretty fast for a small uh, non-game fish. We put these fish in Big Beaver Island Creek and the hope is when Lindsay Bridge Dam is, is, is removed, the fish will migrate up in the Dan River. In North Carolina, the best populate, the best habitat for the Roanoke Law Perches is in, is in the Smith River and the Mayo River. Uh, combined, this only makes up about five uh, river miles. Uh, the rest of the basin has habitat, but there's a lot of sand that moves through the Dan River. <clears throat> Move these fish into the upper Dan River and the upper Mayo River, where there's about 50 miles of habitat in the Dan, about 15 miles of optimal habitat in the Mayo. As I mentioned earlier, um, it's hard to move an endangered species into rivers or streams where they don't currently occur. Um, so the hope is in 2021, we'll have a safe harbor agreement in place where we'll be able to stock these fish in the Upper Dan and Upper Mayo and, and reestablish pop historic populations where we believe they occur. In the Dan River, we have the listed James Spiny mussel and in the figure on you can see uh, the red dots is where we have James Spiny mussel populations. This is where we want to put Roanoke Law Perch. Uh, we, we believe that introducing an, another federally listed species will not incur a more perceived regulatory burden on private citizens. Uh, there you can see the two dams again, Washington Dam and Lindsay Bridge Dam, and the, the yellow orange triangles are where we currently have Roanoke Law Perch populations. Well, in 2017, the Safe Harbor Agreement was just getting started and we wanted to hedge our bets a little bit in case this didn't happen. Uh, so myself, um, Fish and Wildlife Service employee Sarah Ward and Chris Bass with Chris Bass Engineering started meeting with the town of Madison. Madison owns the Lindsay Bridge Dam. It's kind of a U-shaped dam. The river's flowing from left to right in your view. Uh, the dam was built in the 70s very quickly right around when the Clean Water Act was passed and the dam come to find out uh, was failing. The city contracted with um, a dive group in 2000, late 2017. They found that the dam was leaning downstream. Um, the dam is a sheet pollen driven into the river. It's um, about six foot drop from the top of the water to the to the bottom of the water. Here's a shot of the dam leaning downstream. As as the Dan River floods, uh, more trees and debris had hitten, hitting the hit the dam and caused the dam to lean downstream. And the town and other folks <clears throat> was worried that the dam would fail. And what's critical to the town is that they have their water supply intake just upstream of the dam. So they needed to have some structure there in the in the river to impound the water in order to uh, put their straw in and get drinking water. Another key factor about this dam was that two people died, the, died here since 2008. When the water gets up or even when the water's low, if you go over the dam, uh, there's a really bad hydraulic there where you kind of get stuck in there and you can't get out. Also in Western Rockingham County, this is a really hot spot for recreation and fishing. Um, most of the spring and summer throughout that time, it's um, crowded with people and they put in here and they float down the Dan River. So. We thought, and the town thought, it would be a win-win to, to help them fix this dam, to use the Roanoke Law Perch uh, leverage um, to get funding for this dam, to lower the dam, to create fish, fish passage, um, to, to make sure we have safe recreation here. And number one for the town was to secure their water supply. So in 2018, Chris Bass Engineering um, along with partners came up with this design to create um, basically fish ladder uh, to build these weirs up to the dam and allow the fish to go over eight inches of, of a step 
uh, one at a time until it got up to the dam. Uh, so the dam would maintain about a four to five foot uh, weir, and then each weir going downstream would be about eight to ten inches lower. Uh, basically like a long drawn out fish arch that they built on the Cape Fear River. 2020 has been a heck of a year uh, and at the beginning of this year I thought it would happen and then March came and then we thought well this is not going to happen. And then the Fish and Wildlife Service got approval and lo and behold in September we started uh, dumping rock. And the vast majority of the 2.5 million dollar project is spent on rock. Uh, to date, we've moved about 10,000 tons of rock into the river. Uh, the first weir was completed September 22nd, and then October 4th, uh, the dam was gone. And each, as it went downstream, they would build another weir. Here's a shot of uh, the, the top weir, which was where the dam was, is gone in the second weir. Uh, before they built the third weir, there was about a four foot drop there. And so when they built the fourth weir, that drop decreased to about eight to 10 inches. So you can see where the dam used to be in the left part of your screen. Um, now the dam is gone and it's a nice glide so fish can pass that. And Chris Bass sent me this picture from uh, yesterday. And this is looking upstream from the bottom weir. Um, they almost they will complete the seventh weir today and we now have fish passage um, over the dam the town still has their their water intake there's still about a million dollars worth of work to do on all the banks to to slow down some of the erosion that was being caused from the dam uh, but we're confident now that the roanoke law perch in the dam river will move over this old in, impediment and and establish itself in those upper 50 miles up to the virginia state line this next slide should be a video of a, a little bit of weir construction. It may it may jump on you, but bear with me. So the way that there we go. So, you know, where, where we started with the Ro Roanoke log perch is really a success story um, of science and on the ground conservation. Just two years ago, there was a dam removed on the Pig River in Virginia and it opened up about a 50 miles of the Pig River population. And now we've got another 50 miles in the Dan River. It's our hope in the Roanoke River Basin that we can restore this population. Um, there's still large dams in place that we cannot connect populations. Uh, the the Phil Park Reservoir on the Smith River will be there, and Smith Mountain Lake on the Roanoke will all, will probably always be there. But we have other opportunities in North Carolina to get fish above the Mayo River dams, and hopefully, in the next five to ten years, we'll find these fish in the Upper Dan River, and we can either downlist or delist this this fish. This last video, if it will play, is a shot from CFI. This this is what a lot of hard work. <laughs> blood, sweat, and tears goes into. It's kind of jumpy on my end. Uh, we've got another three years contracted with CFI. We've got another three years contracted with the CFI to do more propagation, and hopefully over the, the next three to four years, we'll be able to reestablish the population in the Mayo River once we get the safe harbor agreement passed. Uh, one thing I failed to mention, when this population was first listed, um, in the in the late 80s, there was about 80 river miles, and in 2000 there was about 150 river miles of occupied habitat by Roanoke Law Perch. Once we finish the Dan River this year in the Lindsay Bridge Dam, and they populate that 50 miles, we'll be over 450 river miles of of occupied habitat by Roanoke Law Perch. It really is a success story for the science and for the fish being able to do what it's done. And with that, uh, that's about it. I would like to thank um, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, for contributing to, to this project in North Carolina. Uh, Sarah Ward has been instrumental. The town of Madison really has changed its changed its tone over the last three years. Mayor Myers there has been awesome to work with. Kevin Ball, the town manager. Uh, Michael Perkins, the biologist that works with me. We've been busting our tail in the Dan River for five years and it 
it really shows off shows what we can do when we put our minds together and work together for this fish i think that's it at this time i'll take any questions all right yeah thanks tr that was great great presentation great um, example of uh, conducting the science and then applying the science to the conservation, as you said. Um, as we get started and, and folks uh, put any questions you have in the chat box, TR, if you would explain explain what a what a safe harbor really is uh, to everybody that's on the line. The, the easiest example of safe harbor in North Carolina is for the red cockaded woodpecker. And if you're a landowner and you say you have habitat for the, the red cockaded woodpecker well you don't want sign you don't want fish and wildlife service bringing red cockaded woodpeckers onto your land because you may want to cut down your trees one day so the safe harbor agreement basically says that we're going to put these red cockaded woodpeckers there with your with your agreement that they don't really exist there but we're going to keep restoring them and a lot of times landowners will come on board and as you can see with the red cockaded woodpecker you can really establish a lot of populations with the safe harbor agreement without having that regulatory burden on the private landowner uh, it's worked good for that bird because there's a lot of big um, corporations and big bigger land holdings in the east uh, eastern north carolina it it's going to be a jump with a fish but we believe that if if a like duke energy signs on and other people sign on they won't have this regulatory burden of another uh, federally listed species in in their water you know, Duke Energy has water intakes and dams and coal-fired power plants in the basin. Um, they're just a, an example. There's a lot of other uh, players involved, but I hope that's a little bit clear. It, it basically just removes the regulatory, any regulatory burden and treats the population as if it, it doesn't exist. Right. All right. Um, got a couple of questions for you. The first is, are there plans to remove the dams on the Mayo River? or are you planning some other passage system we've been brainstorming with that heavily and the potential to remove those two dams is very low they're both owned by uh, one company um, and they create quite a bit of power for that company um, they're not like the six foot failing dam on the dam they are concrete um, 10 to 12 foot dams uh, and they're actually in use for more just they do have water supply as well for the town of Mayo Dan. Um, the, you know, spending two million dollars for to move a fish over these two back-to-back -back dams doesn't seem feasible to me. If um, what we're leaning on right now is, you know, taking that money, taking some some of that money and doing propagation and and just reestablishing another population upstream of those dams. And uh, if you know the Mayo River, it splits right at the Virginia North Carolina line, and there's miles and miles of the North Mayo and the South Mayo. That if we can get that fish uh, established up at the Virginia state line, we feel like it will it will take off on its own. But it, it's unlikely those dams come out. Okay. Uh, next question: Can you give some context to the scale of the genetic hetero heterozygosity value? Assuming it's on a zero to one scale, does one represent some ideal, perfect maximum possible? Is it 100% or is it just, quote, I want this number as close to one as possible? <laughs> That's the easiest example I, I could say. Um, I think um, what they what Jamie did was use those those populations that had not been impacted the most and and modeled a a number that he thought was close to one what would be closest to the perfect number and then he ran all those other populations on that um so it's um it's kind of it's hard to explain um, the easiest way to look at it is if it's less than 0.5 your genetic diversity is pretty low and you probably got some brothers and sisters in their breeding um and then the dan we're close to that uh, you know we're in the 0.6s so there's some there's some brothers and sisters that came over the uh, field park reservoir that came down the dam, but also we have enough um, unrelated individuals that were that were creeping above 0.5 uh, or points. We're getting close to 0.7. And one thing I failed to mention was we went in the Upper Smith and got um, several females and males to add to the propagation that Conservation Fisheries was doing. So we added those that genetic diversity into the fish that we captured in North Carolina. So 
uh, we're hoping um, with mixing those, we kind of get over that bottleneck that we that we think happened in North Carolina. All right, good. Uh, next question. Do you think the species can be delisted once we get the species above those dams in North Carolina? Uh, for me, yes. Uh, for the scientific community, probably not because it's um, we're it's hard to explain. But when you've taken 30 years of a fish and you know, use millions of dollars to get research. It's hard to take the the calf off of the off the cow. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's it's probably not going to be de delisted until there's a lot of other threats taken away. Okay. I think it can be downlisted easily. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, yep, here's another one. Okay, the Dan is known for high flood events and high turbidity. Do you think that that will affect your restoration efforts on the upper Dan? That's yet to be yet to be seen. the 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 biggest problem with the Dan is the the relic land use that occurred up there. Uh, most of the most of the small dams are gone. There was a dozen mill dams on the dam. Uh, it's still improving. The dam is improving yearly after year. What what worries me is these floods we've been getting the last three years. If this is climate change, that that is the biggest worry in the back of my mind. If we're going to keep getting these 100, 500 year floods every year, it's it's not going to be good. OK. Um, that's all I've got in the in the chat. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Um, if not, I'm going to thank you again, TR, for a really good presentation. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, and again, it'll be uh, it'll be posted on YouTube here uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, we're uh, just continuing to do these right now every month. Our goal is to have these webinars at 11 o'clock on the second Tuesday of every month. And so you'll keep seeing emails from me and uh, and and I appreciate everybody logging in. Uh, TR, you're getting lots of, of great job well dones uh, in the chat box and I, uh, I couldn't agree with those more. Uh, so with that, again, thanks to everybody. Everybody stay, stay safe, be well, uh, and we'll, we'll talk to you and see you even if it's through Teams uh, on another day.